Hi, everybody. My name is Heidi Kelly Gibson. I am female with red hair and my pronouns are she, her. I am certified as a PMP and also as a certified professional in accessibility core competencies. I have been working in the accessibility field for about three and a half years now, most recently in the role of a customer success manager, which allows me to work with many different teams and companies to implement accessibility related changes within their organizations and teams. But as a mom and wife, accessibility has touched my life for decades. My husband is dyslexic, my daughter has ADHD, and my stepson is autistic. Michael? Thanks, Heidi. I'm Michael Harshbarger. I'm also a, pro a certified project manager. Um, I am a senior accessibility trainer here at DQ. Um, I have been at DQ for three and a half years. Uh, one reason I made accessibility my full-time gig is because I have three very important people in my life that taught me a lot about accessibility. First and foremost is my older brother, Tim. Uh, Tim is completely blind, but had low vision all his life. And so he has shown me the importance of accessibility and uh, how it can open uh, new worlds to people who um, don't have those before. Also, I'm a father of four. My two middle kids, Grace, who is 22, and Seth, who is 19, both at university, uh, both have ADHD and dyslexia, and they have honored me um, with the ability to learn accessibility through their eyes as they've shared it to me. And I usually mention those three because they might come up during conversation because they've given me permission to share their stories for everyone uh, because even though we're gonna talk about change management, uh, what we're gonna quickly find is everything is about people. And we wanna make sure that we underscore that, especially when talking about accessibility. So let's get started and talk about change management. So I surely have to start off today's presentation with a, a cartoon. I used to think Dilbert was so, so funny, except in my previous role, um, I was considered a project manager and one of my team members pointed out that, wait, if you're a project manager, then aren't you the pointy haired boss for some people? And, and then it quit being funny all of a sudden. But our Dilbert cartoon is very good today. And the fact is the first panel, the pointy haired boss is sitting in a team meeting and he announces we're hiring a director of change management to help employees embrace strategic changes. On the second panel, Dilbert answers, or we could come up with strategies that make sense, then employees would embrace the change. And the third pa panel, of course, the pony ad boss has to uh, answer back. Yeah, that, but that sounds harder. Why is change management so important? Um, because we came up with this quote, if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. Uh, and change management is not that hard because believe it or not, you're probably already doing some form of change management, both in your professional and personal life. Uh, organizational change management uh, is just going to bring a framework uh, to that. So today, Heidi and I are going to show you four different project. Uh, uh, we're going to show you four different uh, change management philosophies, um, and we're going to show you from easy to hard. Um, and we're going to have you think about how these focus and how these look at for accessibility. Heidi? So there is nothing permanent about, sorry, nothing permanent except change. Um, on average, organizations today have gone through five major firm-wide changes in the past three years, and nearly 75% expect to increase the types of major change initiatives they will undertake in the next three years. This underlines how important it will be to get comfortable with change management and think about the strategies that will work within your organization. It isn't going away. While businesses are frequently undergoing big changes these days, about half of change initiatives fail, whereas only 34% report clear success, 16% of change initiatives report mixed results. I also can't say enough how important I feel it is to make sure that part of our own change management processes and best practices includes room for lessons learned and growth from those retros. Think about your organization and a change that took place recently. This can be a major change like a reorg, or it can be a department change like a new process to follow. How was it approached? Was it successful? What went well and what could have been improved? Michael, any ideas on how we can be more successful? Thanks, Adi. Yeah, um, what we found is the three most important elements of a successful change transformation 
is fun, engaging communication. And you're going to hear that come up a lot as we talk through uh, the different change management of philosophies that we're going to talk about. Executive sponsorship is very important and innovation councils to sustain to change. So engaging people, making sure you're taking it back to the team can be a useful tactic here. Why you still need to ha make the change and the change might be hard. You can't do everything the team asks. You're still gonna build trust and create a bridge for acceptance as you engage individuals in change. In fact, we have found uh, that as you engage the team and you engage executive leadership, those changes in the in the percentage of the increases um, as you're engaging those different levels of the organization. Heidi, can you tell us how change management and risk management might be related? Yes, so they are closely related. Rather than avoid risk, take intelligent risk. It will give you a competitive edge. Change and risk management go hand in hand. Many organizations have found by implementing change management, it also helps to lower risk and increase tolerance. So the introduction and adoption of anything new holds some form of risk naturally. And some of that risk, and some of the risk adverse organizations I've worked with smartly manage these changes with the support and collaboration of their risk department. Connect with those risk management teams as you're making your plans and as the change is rolled out. Organizations have risk acceptance and environmental constraints to deal with. Change management must incorporate these factors into the strategy. High velocity accessibility, which is the concept of shifting as far left in the software delivery life cycle to address accessibility, is a significant organizational change. Treat it as such by relying on other internal processes and teams that can support you. These are all great thoughts as you start to consider change management and the various methods to implement them. So, like Michael mentioned, we're gonna start with a baseline for you, starting simple and then building in complexity. The baseline we're starting with here is Lewin's three-stage model. Um, Lewin proposed that the behavior of any individual in response to proposed change is a function of group behavior and also that any interaction or force affecting the group structure affects the individual's behavior and their capacity to change. When you're trying to implement a process change, like including accessibility testing in your software delivery lifecycle, if you aren't thinking about the positive and negative ways the group and individual might see the change affecting them, and if you aren't addressing those concerns, you are risking the success and adoption of the change. Another way to put it, Lewin re re recognized that there was a capacity to which an individual could change that was directly related to how the change process was approached. The pros of this model is it can be very proactive. It allows the change agent to control the shift. You can create sustainable changes that are part of your culture and people don't feel like they are in catch up mode. The first stage is unfreeze, which is about perception management. You're determining what needs to change, creating the need for it, and you're managing and, the, and understanding the doubts and concerns that people will have about the change. People are gonna resist change. And the goal on the stage is to create an awareness of how the status quo is hindering the organization. We don't use accessibility testing in our SDLC today, so why should we? Well, because we aren't reaching all our customers or providing solutions that all our customers need. This means we lose business and our reputation might be tarnished. Our competitors are already implementing accessibility process changes. We need to stay competitive. Old behaviors, ways of thinking, processes, people, and organizational structures must all be carefully examined to show employees how necessary changes for the organization. A lot of thought goes into the unfree stage, as you can see. Try to anticipate where the resistance might happen and address those things up front. You might survey the team about their feelings regarding testing for accessibility so you can create a strategic change vision and strategy, which will help you address their concerns proactively. Communication is always important, but it's especially important during the unfreezing stage so employees can become informed about the imminent change, the logic behind it, and how it's gonna benefit and affect them. The more they know about the change, the more likely they are to accept it and the more motivated they will be. Implementing the accessibility testing in our process means fewer accessibility bugs are found in production, which means less work for the entire team. In order for big changes to take hold, people at every level of the org need to understand why these org changes are taking place. 
With the top-down approach, the gap in understanding between the C-suite and entry-level employees is a whopping 31%. Comparing this to an open source change strategy where the gap shrinks to just 3%. Remember what is important in the unfreezing stage is what is the change, why are we doing it, how it's gonna impact me. Be honest and transparent and communicate. The next stage is called changing, and it is the implementation of the change. You're going to continue to do lots of communication about the change and how it's rolling out and what needs to be done. You will dispel rumors and address concerns from the teams, and you will empower action. I'd consider an agile and iterative approach in the stage. It is a time that's marked with uncertainty and fear, making it the hardest step to overcome. The more prepared team members are for this step, the easier it is to complete continue to guide impacted team members. And back to our implementation of accessibility testing example, showcase that the team established a test plan or completed the necessary learning and share those wins. The final stage in this model is refreeze. You're anchoring the changes into the culture. You'll develop ways to sustain the change, establish the feedback system, adapt and the org structure wherever it's necessary and celebrate success. The final stage is when the change you implemented becomes the status quo now. The team just considers it the way of doing business. If the step is skipped or not completed, the organization can return to the old way of doing things. So take time to review what has been accomplished so far, celebrate. And remember that rewards do not have to be monetary. Celebrating teamwork and group accomplishments, you can share photos of the team working together, making it fun, and then resolve any outstanding issues. Wrapping up Lewin's model, it looks at change in basic terms. It encourages change leaders to identify patterns or problems. It works well when you have strong support from senior management. It will be imperative that you provide ways to continue upskilling and continuous training so until the change is second nature. To change the culture of an organization, you must anchor the change in the culture itself. It's important to note that fewer phases in your change management model do not equate to a faster transition. The changing stage often is spread out over a long period of time to overcome resistance and provide adequate training. Here is one I hear in various forms all the time. It seems like a lot of work for the team, considering there are not a lot of people with disabilities that use our website. First, I wanna point out that the statement is not true. One in four Americans self-identify as having a disability and 10 to 15% of the world population reports the same. Using Lewin's model, you're gonna handle these kind of reactions in your unfree stage. You'll proactively find out how your team will feel about changes so you can put together good communication about what the change is and address their concerns proactively. You are going to correct any misconceptions they might have Tell the team and individuals why the change is important and be clear about how it affects them. Michael, how would the PDCA model apply to this? Thanks, Heidi. So we have a model called Plan, Do, Check, Act. William uh, Deming made Plan, Do, Check, Act famous. He did this when he was working with the uh, Japanese manufacturing post-World uh, War II. Um, Deming always gave credit for this model to his mentor, Walter Schuhart. And Schuart based this model on the scientific method, so it might look a little familiar to everyone. Also, uh, Toyota uses this model uh, as part of their lean manufacturing method, and the lean manufacturing method is also what many agile frameworks are based on. So we have plan, do, check, and act. So let's dig a little bit more in each of those. So what's plan? Well, plan is exactly like it sounds. Plan a change. Recognize that opportunity. What Define what I need, right? So what do I need to be able to do this change? How can I make this solution happen? Understand the problem I'm trying to address. Like, what kind of problem do we have? What does the team have and need to be able to successfully tackle that problem? And what does success look like? Because in the ACT phase, we're going to take a look back and we're going to say, hey, is this what I expected it to do? Now, one thing I really haven't mentioned in the plan phase is many of the things Heidi mentioned with Llewellyn count in this phase too, right? Bring awareness, use communication, talk to the team, 
understand what some of the roadblocks might be. So for example, let's use an example. We don't know what the cost to the organization is in time and money to incorporate accessibility changes in our department. Our plan is to take a couple pages that represents our site from a recent assessment and change those pages. So we're gonna look for a team that represents the level of accessibility knowledge found in the rest of the organization. So we're gonna do this on a little smaller scale to get an idea of what it's gonna look like when we roll it out to the rest of the organization. Then we're gonna do the change. So we're gonna call out, carry out that small sales study. We're gonna execute the plan that we decided to do. So we're gonna take those couple pages, we're gonna bring it to the team. A friend of mine would always refer to this as plan the work, work the plan. So we go back to our plan, we figure out what pages we put in there, we choose them to put them in what sprint, and then using the normal processes like sprint backlog, grooming, planning poker, et cetera, we put those changes into our development cycle. Now, why the team is working on those changes, what we're gonna do is we're gonna check. We're gonna collect data from the results in the do phase. We're gonna look and compare the data to see similarities and differences. Also, we're gonna look at the actual do process and say, hey, did it go pl as planned? Meaning, was it regular business or were there changes that we had to make during the process to get it to work? Now, one of the things important while you're collecting that data is try to make a visual representation of the data. Why? Because it's going to help you see trends. It's going to help you see how the team is doing. Now, the data could be asking the team how they're doing. It could be asking customers um, you know, how, how the, the, the uh, results happened. It even can be the fact is we're measuring the velocity of our particular team. So as we're working on the sprint, we're going to measure the velocity on the pages during the current sprint. Then we're going to compare that to the estimations given during sprint planning. We're also going to make sure the team document any struggles they had after they changed the code. And because we're measuring what it takes to do these pages, we're going to focus on the code during code reviews and team retrospectives because all of this is going to go into the act phase. So the plan do and check, it's gonna find lessons learned, right? This is where continuous improvement comes in. So we're gonna take the measurements and we're gonna sit down and we're gonna do a retrospect on it. We're gonna say, okay, what were the issues? How was the process? Is there any changes we can make? Because what we're trying to do is make the next cycle improved. See, the key with plan, do, check, act is it's an iterative process. We're going to keep doing it and expanding it over and over again as we learn more and more about the process and how it's working. Now, one thing we need to make sure in the act and the check is we need to make sure that the team and the organization believe that those are lessons learned. Because according to a 2017 University of Chicago study, if people believe that the change will fail, any setback is, is a sign of ultimate failure. Then the poise start disengaging. And because of this belief, it of course becomes true and it fails. So we need to underscore to the team that this is a continuous learning process. So for example, after the sprint is complete, we're gonna review what happened during the sprint on these pages. We're gonna, if we finish on time or early, we're gonna talk about what opportunities there were that helped that happen. If anything took longer, we're gonna talk about what was missing and how we could have done it differently. The team's gonna talk about tools and processes and training and other things that might improve our time to market in the next sprint, in the next look of plan, do, check, act. And then we're gonna feed this information into our next planning cycle. And then we're gonna discuss the sec next set of pages and the teams that we're gonna roll this out to, and we're gonna repeat. So check, plan, do, check, act, or PCDA is iterative and it's meant to be continuous improvement for learning. You can start with a pilot and grow your change by adding teams and processes as you learn, and you're figuring out what to measure so you can learn and improve what's important and then make sure the team sees failure as a learning opportunity, not proving that the changes are not working. 
Now, one question I get occasionally is, hey, there's a lot of automated tools on the market that we can use like Axe Dev Tools. How the heck are we gonna be even sure that the teams use them as we put them out there? I think we would all agree accessibility automation has matured a lot in the last three years. Uh, these are now viable solutions that are going to help us meet our accessibility goal. So with PCDA, we know what we're gonna do. So plan becomes easy. We pick the team, so the do also becomes a little easier to do. Again, I want us to keep in mind that the topics that Heidi discussed in Lewin's model, are st we're still communicating, we're still building awareness in these phases. It's just part of change management, and it's not gone away. But the check becomes very interesting, because my thought immediately goes to, you know what I'll do? I'll measure the number of issues. And if I see those issues go down, I know instantly that they're using the tools. But is that all the information I need to know to improve the process? So tool usage is also important. So it's making sure that the issues are going down, but it's also making sure that people are using the tool effectively. It could be I don't see a decrease in issues because the tools aren't being used effectively. So this is one of those where I'm going to measure where and when the tool is used and also how the tool is being used. And I can make it part of my act to talk about, is there things I should do differently to make sure that the team knows automated tools are out there that they can use and they can make sure uh, that they're part of their sprint. Now we've talked about Lewin's, We've talked about plan, do, check, act. But you know, when we get to larger organizations and more complex change, what kind of models could we lean on there? So Heidi, I know you've got an idea of one model that's probably gonna work for us. You bet. So naturally, you're gonna need to look at a more complex strategy when you have a larger organization. Um, as we go through ADCAR, our next one, you're going to see that we're repeating a lot of the same themes that you've already heard. Um, we're gonna give some different examples of how you can use ADCAR to build on those themes and get a little more detailed. Jeffrey Hyatt is the founder of ProSci. He developed this outcome-oriented change management method ADCAR is an acronym, and we'll go through the stages of what that represents in a moment. It aims to limit res resistance to org change. It's used to facilitate change by setting clear milestones to be reached throughout the process. It is sequential, and it is critical that every person in the change must reach the goal, though they may reach it at different times. It's a bottom-up method that puts the focus on the people behind the change. Our first stage, which makes up the A in ADCAR, is the awareness stage. You need to communicate and grow awareness for why the change is needed. <laughs> That's going to sound familiar. We've already talked about it. I'm going to use a different example here of designers. So our designs are not accessible. Why does that matter? Because in high velocity accessibility, design and conceptualization is one of the first areas that accessibility best practices can be applied. If you're designing accessibly, then there is a lower risk that accessibility issues will get to production, resulting in significant cost savings. We all know the further in the SDLC you let a bug get, the more expensive it is to fix it. You aren't just announcing, hey, you're going to start applying accessibility best practices in your designs now, but you are growing the awareness of why it's important. Consider these influencing factors. A person's view of the current state. The old adage of, if it's not broke, don't fix it. How will you address that? How a person perceives the problems. There are different cognitive styles to help people internalize new information. What about the credibility of the sender of the information? If it's coming from someone who is well-respected and has a reputation for being direct and honest, it's going to go generally well versus someone that maybe the team members don't know or has a history of vague communication. The circulation of misinformation or rumors. You can't always tell everyone everything, but you have to be ready for misinformation or rumors that may spring up. What about the contestability of the reason for change? A change might make sense to the team, but then a respected member of the team opposes it. What do you do? 
The next model, the uh, next stage in this model is the desire stage, which is the D in ADCAR. Um, is it a normal progression from awareness? It can be, but it isn't always a place that people arrive at on their own simply by knowing that a change exists. Growing that awareness can plant the seed that grows into a desire to make the change. Yes, as a designer, I want to make accessible designs. It's the right thing to do, and it makes the rest of the project go easier. I want to be clear and concise in my communications to developers so they can have be code accessibly too. Factors to consider is if there's resistance, address it head on and immediately. The organizational context for the change. How much change is already going on? That can greatly impact the team's willingness or desire to go through more change. An individual's personal situation. We are all individuals. We have home lives. Think about what might be going on in other areas of the team's lives. And then think about what motivates them. The K in ADCAR is the knowledge stage. How do we make the change? How do we learn what we need? What skills are we going to have to acquire? Where do we find those materials? I'm excited to start including accessibility in my designs, but there's one problem. I don't know anything about accessibility. How do I learn what I need to know? What are the processes I need to follow internally? And will I be expected to teach others panic? <laughs> Too much change at once can be jarring and disorienting, leading to the resistance to change. So implement appropriately. Factors to consider here that can impact your success is the current knowledge base of an individual. Some of your team members might know nothing about accessibility, while others might have some knowledge or a lot of knowledge. You need to meet each of them where they are. The capacity to gain additional knowledge and the resources that are available for education and training and then keeping in mind, it is equally important to provide knowledge that allows your team to see the change through to the end, not just at the beginning. In fact, training programs for new systems have proven to be critical both during and after change has been implemented. 69% of the most effective change programs offer training before and after go live. The second A in ADCAR is the ability stage. Think of ability as not just knowing how to do something, but having the confidence in your own capabilities and achieving the desired performance level. We know about accessibility standards and how they apply some of, and how to apply some of them to our designs. To be successful, we set goals within the team and are starting with only thinking about color contrast and consistency in our buttons in our component library in our first two sprints. After the first two sprints, we will measure the success of those being rolled out, adjust, and then expand to other accessibility requirements in the third sprint. Bridging the gap between knowing how and feeling good about it by putting change leaders in charge of coaching individuals or teams is a great idea. Provide hands-on training to test out skills before changes are rolled out so confidence can be built. This allows you to monitor performance as well and adjust your plan as appropriate. Consider implementing in phases or stages. Factors to consider, psychological blocks. I've always done it this way, I can't change. Physical abilities, intellectual capabilities, the time available to develop the skills, balancing your workloads, and the availability of resources to support development. Where do I even start learning? How do I do this on top of everything else I have going on? And the final stage is the reinforcement stage. This is where you're celebrating the success, making sure it sticks. By implementing accessibility standards in the design process, the team was able to reduce the number of accessibility issues by 60%. That's a real number, by the way. You can really achieve that. Publicly give praise and privately address poor behavior or mistakes. Continue to monitor pain points, gather feedback, and see where extra support might be needed. Consider these factors, the degree to which the reinforcement is meaningful to the person impacted by change, the absence of negative consequences. Everyone on the team should be increasing productivity by 50% or else. Don't do that. Accountability systems to reinforce the change. This can be as simple as a manager or a change agent checking in with the individual or group routinely to talk about the goals set and the progress towards them. Overall, ADCAR is about putting focus on the employees. It limits resistance and speeds up implementation. It values employee input and support. Instead of that mandate, you must consider accessibility in your designs now 
Start a conversation with employees to make them aware of the need for the change and convince them of the benefits. What do you think about having or being a more accessible in our designs so that fewer bugs get to production and we don't have to redesign our components which are already in use in production? It ensures a higher access rate for sustained change compared to methods that do not actively involve the people that are infected by the changes. And I also would recommend combining ADCAR with other models that will handle emotional reactions to change. I want you to think about everything you know about ADCAR and have learned today so far, hopefully that's lots, and think about this problem. How would you use ADCAR to address this problem and the needed change? We just did an assessment and there are thousands of issues to fix. Where do I even begin to start? There's no way we can fix that many errors. Some things I'd suggest thinking about for each stage is for awareness. Who needs to know the results of the assessment and the accessibility goals from business or compliance? The desire, it's the right thing to do. We've mentioned that before. Um, it, it's keeping you competitive. Um, it's keeping you out of litigation. Those are some of those desire components. The knowledge, how do we even fix this? Getting the team members the information they need to be able to do the work that's gonna have to be done. The ability is implementing those changes in stages based on the priority. You have a thousand issues you have to address. That's an insurmountable number. You need to break that down into something you can bite off. And then reinforcement, celebrating the individual changes as they're completed and the final work getting done. Thanks, Heidi. I appreciate that. Awareness, desire, knowledge, ability, re reinforcement. It's very powerful as you go through that. So what we're going to do is we're going to change gears a little bit because this model is going to be different from the other ones we've shown you today because this is not about the how. This model is going to be about a where. And the reason why we wanted to share this model with you is because many times I started a change somewhere in the co corporation and noticed it really wasn't taking hold. And I started wondering to myself, did I consider all the different parts that I needed to support my change that I'm making? So this framework consists of six domains with the mnemonic INVEST, ideation, nature, vision, engagement, synthesis, and transformation. So it assists companies in retooling their approach. It will help a company select a strategic project and execute them. So the first one is ideation. It's where passion and drive are born. Ideation is where your company understands what it is, how it appears in the world, and we express it through purpose, identity, and long-term vision. Identity is the company's personality, image, brand, values, it distinguishes the company, it determines its competitiveness. Purpose is the root of the company's existence. It gives people the reason to come to work every day. Um, it also focuses on their business. And then of course, long-term uh, uh, vision is long-term success and also defines what their commitments are. So if let's say I decided that accessibility was important to my organization. Does the mission statement support it? What part of my identity shows that accessibility is part of the way I do business? Uh, what if I show the, the people of the organization that this is just not a flavor of the month? Is it part of my long range intention? Idea is important, but also something from the organization that also lets others know it's important to us long term. Nature, nature creates the conditions which implementing the strategy. So the strategy embodies the culture, the structure, the environment, and the context it operates. Culture combines the organization outcomes, core values, actions, how the company gets the job done. Structures are a way, of course, the organization has relationships between area. And finally, strategy is the organization's roadmap. Again, implementing accessibility in my organization is a part of the company's culture that supports this direction. Can I tie the importance of accessibility to a company value or personal value? Is there anything about the structure that might inhibit it? Did structure uh, is did the structure of the adoption of the accessibility make look like accessibility just look like something else the team needs to do, or it's part of the team fabric? Vision vision includes goals and metrics uh, and strategies from the business. Right goals are going to define clear and desirable outcomes. Metrics are indication of progress towards those goals, 
And then also uh, strategy is an organization's roadmap for achieving those goals and objectives. So what goals do I have for accessibility? Is accessibility part of all the goals that the company has? What am I measuring with accessibility? One thing I've found in my personal journey is people work hard on what they're being measured. So I'm, am I measuring the positive outcomes or am I just measuring the negative outcomes? Because if people can see positive success, they usually are encouraged to do it more. Engagement, well, by linking our strategy to our portfolio investments, the company funding and the right projects to event our, our strategy, Strategy is an organization's roadmap for achieving goals and objectives. The best path is how our company and organization gets the work done. And a portfolio is gonna be the set of projects and initiatives that put this in place. The strategy and the portfolio follow what we wanna do. How am I funding my accessibility efforts? Do multiple entities have a stake in the success of accessibility? Now, if we look down the model, we also see synthesis, which also includes portfolio programs and projects. Again, portfolios are the projects and initiatives put in place. A program is a number of irrelated projects. A project is a unique dedicated effort. It's this level is usually the one we focus our changes on. We need to change the tactical, so we make sure that we focus on the tactical. But this also underscores, as you saw the top of the model, that we've done everything above to make sure success is possible. So what's going to make sure that this is the new status quo versus just going back to old things? And then transition, we're gonna convert the output to operations. Transition is gonna be our measure of success as it allows us to bring the results to project-based work and the core of the keys to our company's uh, uh, operations. A project is unique, de de a dedicated effort, and the program is a number of interrelated projects, then the operation is the ongoing process of the company to deliver those values to the customers. And how do I make accessibility just part of the day-to-day -day fabric of how we do things? So it's not something additional. What, you want me to do accessibility with everything else I do? How the heck am I supposed to fit this in with the rest of my work? You can quickly see that this argument is one that we might hear. Now, what if I change the question from accessibility to security? What, you want me to do security with everything else I already do? I just smile thinking about the answer to that question. The answer of course would be yes, I would expect you to do security. Um, I almost would wanna look at the person and go, yeah, yeah, expect to work here, right? The reason we find that question funny is because organizations have aligned their purpose, identity, long-term goals, culture, structure, goals, measurement, strategy, portfolio, program, projects, operations to security. I also want to remind everybody that this didn't happen overnight. It happened because of the risk to the brand. It happened because security became a customer expectation. It happened because the company wanted to show competitive advantages on others than how they protected my personal data. A lot of these same arguments can be made with accessibility. So we wanna thank you for your time and energy. I do wanna point out that you can contact uh, Heidi and myself, here's our DQ addresses, or we're both on LinkedIn, if we don't get to your questions in this question time. But with that, Heidi and I would love to ask everybody, is there any questions? Travis, did we get some questions for us? Nope, zero. Yep. Zero. Nobody's oh, interested. No, we were just perfect. kidding. <laughs> we were perfect. No, you got some questions. Um, and for, for those who maybe can't see the screen, um, these slides are available so you can grab those email addresses as well. Um, we've got a few questions and, and some have been upvoted. So I'm going to go ahead and um, throw those at you and um, I'll let you guys fight over them. Um, so the first is, uh, this is from Anonymous. Uh, how do you get users who are frustrated with the failures in the accessibility journey to change the belief that the organization is working on the change. And if I could upvote this, I'm, I would too, and I'm not allowed as a moderator. <laughs> so uh, let me see if I understand the question, uh, Travis is, so I've gotten failures, the team is frustrated and it's like, okay, how is the organization addressing those failures that we're hitting, those roadblocks that we're hitting? And it really gets into change management and back to what Heidi said earlier about communication, right? You truly have to communicate what the priority is for that particular effort. 
because it's easy for us to say, hey, accessibility is important and not put any resources behind it. And so I've seen this frustration of we're trying to move it forward, but there's not the backing. And so what I think we have seen, and there's actually statistics to back this up, accessibility can be a, a, a bottom up, but it also needs to be a top down effort and they need to meet at the middle because as you have failures, you might need the support of the organization. At the same token, the organization, as Heidi's pointed out, needs the, the support of the people around it. Yeah, I think it, the awareness is, the, is that first step. It's starting to grow that and, and get other teams all weighing in. And so that it's the, the topic that everybody's talking about that's a really big part of it um, and, and gaining that traction. Okay, so we had a duplicate of that question almost verbatim, but it was directed dir directly at Michael. Um, so I'll skip over that one. Uh, here, the next one is also from Anonymous. I'm interested to know which change management tool, um, the parenthetical says readiness assessment, risk assessment, impact assessment, et cetera, is most critical to accessibility adoption. I would say, and the reason why Heidi and I picked the uh, change management philosophies we had is because you can see ADCAR is a little bit more involved than Lewin. And it really depends on the, all of the size and the culture of your organization. So I will say what I've seen in the past, Lewin has a tendency to be a little more, for lack of a better term, unofficial. And so you're working in a smaller organization Lewin might do the exact trick for you. If you're working in a more larger corporate environment, uh, the, the, um, the, the actual uh, rigidity or the actual planning part structure of the process in ADCAR has a tendency to work very well in larger organizations. That's one of the reasons you wanna know multiple uh, uh, strange, uh, change strategies because let's face it, there are pros and cons to each of them. In alignment with that, there's one I really like. It's William Bridges' um, method, and it really focuses on the emotional side of change management. It's not just about bringing awareness and, and all of that. It's about thinking about the people that are really being impacted and nurturing them into that change. So some of these models are great. They're wonderful. They're very strategic. I would recommend getting familiar with Bridges as well and layering it in with your other strategies. All right, thanks team. And we've got one that's blowing up the charts um, in, in, right away as soon as it came in. Um, how do you avoid a minimum viable accessibility mindset when balancing a practical versus purist approach to accessibility? Yeah, Travis, I think that gets into starting your journey and understanding where the team is. Uh, one thing that we didn't talk about is the philosophy around um, uh, the accessibility uh, requirements to begin with. I'm a big proponent of those are considered non-functionals. So in, in, in IT, we always talk about the itties, I-T-Y, like security, scalability, performance, et cetera. I really put accessibility in that. And so it becomes less of a feature and more of the backbone of your application. And depending on where the organization is I might start that pile out small. And as I start to mature, that pile of, of uh, non-functional requirements start to grow as my team learns more and more and more. Um, one thing I've seen in organizations, of course, if I try to go to zero to a hundred with one quick slump, everybody's like, whoa, 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 <laughs> I don't know what to do. And you wanna just start that gradually and get to build that to a point where the team understands how important it is for the, uh, center of the application. Yeah, small steps, scale it. Um, sometimes there's policies involved that are being passed along that you have to adhere to. Um, so policy creators, think about that too, is something that's scalable for teams to, to achieve over time. Awesome, great. I know I'm supposed to remain neutral, but I can't agree more that accessibility should be an NFR. Um, that question was really popular. Uh, it, it does tie into another one. Um, well, actually, let me see. Here's a quick one. Um, this is also anonymous. Says, Thanks for the session. Uh, is there a book or two that you might recommend for those of us that are new to this topic? 
Bad Car is a great one. <laughs> it's by Jeffrey Hyatt. And then that one I mentioned for William Bridges is Managing Transitions. Both of these I thought were great reads, easy reads too. So I think those are a good place that at least I started with. Okay, and so good for newcomers. Mm -hmm. yep. And Llewellyn and PDA are very historical, meaning they, they were back in the 40s and 50s. You will be surprised by just searching on the internet how many articles you can find about those that will help just teach you the overall process. And so where ADCAR and uh, Bridges is, are more newer, uh, some of the older processes have a lot of documentation out there that you can, it can walk you through scenarios and, and it's very helpful. Okay, so um, another popular question that is uh, near and dear to you, Michael, is um, what strategy do you recommend for accessibility training? Oh, yeah, that does get very near and dear. <laughs> <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> yeah, that's part of being a senior accessibility trainer. Uh, one, it gets back to the point that uh, Heidi and I made about non-functional requirements. Um, it's easy for me to sit down and train you from soups to nuts exactly how to do accessibility. Uh, what I believe strongly is doing it incremental. Um, I will be honest, one of the questions we picked for our, um, our case studies uh, was on purpose. And that was when we talked about um, automated tools and Axe Dev Tools being one of those. X dev tools before I came to, to, to Q, I actually used it. It helped teach me about accessibility. If there's one thing you take away from AxCon uh, and there's one thing you change tomorrow if you're new to uh, accessibility, um, take download X, X dev tools and, and is, there's a free version of it and just start using it. And what you'll see is that will actually start you on your journey because that's the first step. And so what you need to do is take a little by little and make sure we meet the team where it is. The one thing we have to understand, especially with training a team, I am not going to take a team from, from beginner to expert to advanced in a couple of weeks. It does take time. It's a skill set that you learn, right? And also the thing I have to remember, everybody has to remember, accessibility isn't the only thing I do. So I need to uh, make sure I understand how to grow that skill set. Heidi, do you have any thoughts on that too? Well, I 100% agree. I, uh, having just started really working in the accessibility field three and a half years ago, it was totally overwhelming to me. Um, and so I started small. I set small goals. Um, I wanted to become certified as, as a CPAC. And so I, I, I worked with that. Um, you know, we have the DQ University tool, which was monumental in my education. So I just set small goals, uh, 10 minutes a day, spend 10 minutes a day reading an article, learning a little bit more, and you will be so much further ahead every single day than you were when you started. Um, you won't even see the progress. And then ask a family member to ask you a question about what you know about accessibility, and you'd blow your own mind on how much you can inform them about it. Um, there is one other thing I would mention if you want to know more about change management, how it might affect your, or how it might be implemented, and other thoughts and ideas. There's another session um, by Dylan Barrel and Katie Olson um, tomorrow. It's about accessibility in an agile environment. Um, so I would check that one out too. I think it's a good follow up to this session and, and actually implementing things. Agreed. Agreed 100%. I agree. And um, with that, unfortunately, we're going to be at time. I don't think we can squeeze in another one in 10 seconds. I would recommend that se session and um, hopefully Dylan plugs his book in that session. But if not, check out Dylan Barrow's book on agile accessibility as well. Thank you, um, everyone. Yeah, I, I want to thank our speakers and our audience um, so, so much. And I hope you guys enjoy the rest of AxCon. Um, if you want to grab the slides and, and get in touch with our presenters today, you can do so on the, um, uh, the session uh, page for uh, today's session. Enjoy the rest of AxCon, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Travis. Appreciate it.